بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome back everyone to our reading and our discussion of Imam Al-Ghazali's Al-Arba'in for Usul al-Din The 40 Principles of Religion which is his own essentially summary of Ahya Al-Lum al-Din uh, We are now on part three uh, purification, purifying the heart from blameworthy characteristics. So we are now getting into the section of the book that perhaps most people are more familiar with Imam al-Ghazali speaking about these matters, and he will go through them inshallah. Uh, for those of you who are following with the book, and, and this is the book the, and the translation that I'm using, we are on page 115. <laughs> Imam al-Ghazali says, may we, be benefit, may we benefit from his knowledge in this world and in the next, insha'Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qad aflaha man zakkaha. He who purifies it is surely successful. The pronoun uh, here, the, uh, the female form, Qad aflaha man, sorry, Qad aflaha man tazakka. That's the verse. I, I'm thinking of another verse. Qad aflaha Man tazakka, he who purifies it is surely successful, referring to the self. In the other verse that I was thinking of, qad aflaha man zakkaha wa qad khaba man dasaha, the same sort of meaning, but there the uh, the pronoun uh, is indicating a nafs. Anyway, purification here means cleansing. Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, Purity. Is half of faith. Taharatu shatrul iman. It's a famous hadith that we all know. Purity is half of faith. Now, of course, we would use this hadith to, you know, with our children to remind them you have to be clean and, you know, self care. But also, the greater meaning of the hadith is internal purity, which is what Imam al Ghazali is going to focus on in this third part. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said, purity is half of faith. Imagine that half of our deen is based on purifying ourselves physically and spiritually. So understand from this that perfection of faith is in purifying the heart from what Allah Ta'ala does not like, what we call takhliya, which is to take away the negative traits, and adorning it with what Allah loves, which we call a tahliya, which is to bring those good traits. So both of them are always mentioned together, because you need to know what are those negative traits and then therefore what are their opposites so that you don't fall into the bad trait and that you make sure that you have the positive one. Purity is half of faith, yet how can one be busy with purification while not knowing what is filthy? We shall therefore mention the blameworthy character traits, which are many. However, the branches derive from 10 principles. So one of the benefits that we, we gain from the way Imam al-Ghazali has written his books is he's giving us the, the essential points from which all of the other derivatives come. So there might be a lot of other blameworthy traits, but these 10 are the key. And as you will see, as he takes us through them, he will show us why they are key and how other things can, can come from them. So while there's a whole host of things that we need to worry about. In actuality, it's these 10 that you need to focus on. And then by default, the other things happen. So the first one is gluttony. Sharah uh, at ta'am. Uh, and you might find that odd. And I think Imam al-Ghazali agrees that people might find that odd. So he spent some time explaining this. Gluttony is amongst the greatest sources of harm to the religion for the stomach is the wellspring of desires. That's the principle right there, is that if you want to understand what he's saying, and if you want to uh, uh, even more importantly implement what he's saying, is that the full stomach in the classical ethical understanding, not just of Islam, but other religious traditions, it's overeating, having massive caloric intake, always being physically full of food and drink, this is the source of all of the other problems. In other words, if you're not hungry all the time, if you don't stuff yourself all the time, you have a better chance of warding off all of the other things. And he's going he's gonna to get into that. Gluttony is amongst the greatest sources of harm to the religion, for the stomach is the wellspring of desires. 
From it derives the desires of the genitals, mean, meaning the sexual urge. Then if the, then if the desire for food and sex becomes overpowering, another desire comes forth, love of wealth, for one cannot attain the fulfillment of the first two desires except through it. Then desire for fame der derives from the desire for wealth, for it is difficult to acquire wealth without it. I mean, that's a lot in just one paragraph. So the physical, you know, the calories that we get from the food, this is what in Imam al-Ghazali's argument is what drives the other things. Like if you're, if you're hungry uh, and you're you know, like in Ramadan, you're not really thinking of your sexual appetite. You're thinking of hunger and thirst you're, because you're starving the body. And of course you break your fast at the end of the day. But if you, if you habitualize, which is what Imam al-Ghazali is going to argue at the end of the chapter, if you habitualize going uh, for some periods of time with hunger or lessening the food, that lessening the food will then lessen the desire to do those other things. You're not gonna be as hungry for those other things. Upon attaining fortune and fame or seeking them, all spiritual diseases such as pride, ostentation, envy, hate, enmity, and others crowd together. Again, there's nothing wrong with having wealth and you need to have a certain amount of wealth to live a decent life, to do all the things that he's talking about anyway. Here you should understand this as excess, excess wealth, unnecessary, unnecessary, uh, to be unnecessarily wealthy or you know, people that, that do something and strike it really big and they, you know, their, their geometric you know, wealth is just unproportionate to anything. You know, they become an overnight sort of billionaire. That type of wealth could be dangerous to your spiritual life. It might be good for your dunya life. You might be able to buy all the things that you want and have a bigger this and a better that and so on and so forth. But it's very dangerous for your spiritual self. So you have to keep in mind that while there are things that we acknowledge have uh, their use in the dunya, Imam al-Ghazali is reminding us of the importance of our akhirah as well. Because we want to live in the dunya to get to the akhirah. We don't want to live in the dunya and forget about the akhirah. For this reason, uh, sorry, the origin of all of this is the stomach. For this reason, Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, attached great importance to voluntary hunger. And the, in the, 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 uh, the translator put that in quotations because to remind us that that's the interpretation of the hadith. In other words, we're talking about beyond Ramadan. The Prophet Sallallahu said, there is no practice more beloved to Allah than hunger and thirst. He also said, he who stuffs his belly will not enter heaven's realm. And the master of all action is hunger. He, may, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, also said, contemplation is half of worship and small portions of food is worship itself. He also said, Alayhi Salatu Salam, the best of you to Allah is he who reflects and is hungry the longest. The most loathsome of you to Allah Ta'ala is anyone who eats, drinks, and sleeps excessively. He also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is a famous hadith, the son of Adam does not fill a vessel worse than his belly. Uh, you know, eating to your full, all sorts of drinking to your full, of course, all sorts of ailments and, and difficulties can come from that. And then he continues, a few bites to strengthen his back are enough. Luqaymat, he says in Arabic, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Luqaymat is the tasgheer of luqma. It's the, it's the, um, form of the, the word is to make it small. So a luqma is a bite. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't even say bite, he said luqaymat, like a, a minuscule bite, is enough just that your back is, so you're not so hungry that you're, oh man, crouching over to, to, to clench your stomach, but you just have like one bite of food, one sip of water, okay, that immediate, the pang of hunger, I don't have it anymore, I can stand up straight. That's what the Prophet ﷺ is saying is the mode of how we should be eating. If there's no getting away from it, meaning if, we, if that's too difficult, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, then a third of the belly is for food, a third is for drink, and a third is for the air so you can breathe. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is a very famous hadith. And in all of the, uh, you know, all of my learning uh, circles and all of the Sufi gatherings I've been to, this is a hadith that's always quoted uh, because the people of this art of the of of, of the um, art of tasawwuf and the people that that um, you know teach and live this, 
this is something that they have excelled at. They have excelled at surviving on very little uh, and comfortable going voluntarily on periods of hunger, skipping a meal, uh, skipping, uh, you know, red meat two times, things like that. He'll get into some of that at the end of ways of to do it because as Imam al-Ghazali is going to say, and, and this is important, I think, to, to state over and over again and to repeat it, is all of this stuff has to be done gradually. You can't, you can't read this and be like, oh my God, and, and go all out because then you'll just, you'll fall flat on your face. Imam al-Ghazali is giving, you know, laying the groundwork for us, giving us a lay of the land, explaining to us how this is supporting this from Quran and Sunnah and then some other stories. What are we supposed to do with it? Reflect and gradually make changes. Small little changes today end up becoming habits in the future. The Prophet ﷺ also said, verily Satan flows through the son of Adam like the flow of blood. He circulates amongst you. So let him tighten his pass with hunger and thirst. So when, you, when you're hungry and thirsty, voluntarily, of course in Ramadan this applies, but voluntarily, then you're not thinking about, like you're not going to have time to listen to shaitan. You're just like, man, I got to eat something. Uh, I, I feel that hunger. I feel that thirst. Okay, I'll try to go another hour. I'll try to go another 45 minutes. So you start focusing. And then when you have that food, inshallah, it's, it's also, you're not gorging yourself. You appreciate it. I mean, we all appreciate, no one, none of us ever appreciate water like in Ramadan. Oh my God, that, one, that first sip of water or that first sip of your tea or that first you know, date that you break your fast with or that first cup of milk. Oh my God, it's like the greatest thing ever. But then throughout the year, we forget about that. We're, we're gulp, you know, we have our flasks and we're, we're taking in our water and we're going to Starbucks for the fifth time in the day. So part of this, you know this rationally because you've experienced Ramadan, all of you, alhamdulillah, is that you appreciate, you appreciate those little things. The Prophet, ﷺ, he also said to our mother Aisha, alayhi salam, continuously knock on the gate of paradise and it will be open for you. She said, how do I knock continuously? And he said, alayhi salam, with hunger and thirst. He also said, alayhi salam, eat and drink for only half of your bellies, for indeed, it is a part of prophethood. Meaning this is the way of the prophets is not to overly satiate yourself. Okay, what are the benefits of hunger? Perhaps you desire to know the secret of attaching great importance to hunger and the aspect of its relation to the path of the afterlife. Know that it has many benefits, yet their foundations go back to seven. The first of them is clarity of the heart and keen insight, for indeed, satiation begets idiocy and blinds the heart. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever deprives his belly, his thinking is greater and his heart is perceptive. It is well known that the key to happiness is knowledge, which is not attained except with clarity and illumination of the heart. For this reason, to be hungry is to knock at the doors of paradise. The second is softness of the heart, to the extent that one feels the pleasure of conversing with Allah Ta'ala and being affected by remembrance and worship. Imam al-Junaid radiallahu anhu, he said, one of you will make a barrier between himself and Allah Ta'ala with food and the desire, and then desire to find the sweetness of conversing with Allah Ta'ala. You well know that the states of the heart, whether fear and apprehension, softness and intimacy are brokenness and or brokenness and awe are from the keys of the gates of paradise, even if the gate of knowledge is above these and hunger is a way at knocking at all of them. So the first benefit is this clarity. Now, the reason this is important is if you read all that stuff about hunger and you don't understand its spiritual benefit, then it's, you're just going to make yourself miserable. So the point is, is the inner dimension of all of these things. Having a clear heart. The, Allah Ta'ala says, <laughs> Do they not reflect on the Qur'an? Or are there locks around their heart? So the heart is what we use not just to feel, but it's also what we use to think. So the, the place of, uh, of our rational, the gift of reason, of understanding, the place of taklif, of our moral responsibility, it's in our heart. And that's why it's so important that we guard it. And then the second one is the softness, of course. And then the third, he says, the third is the humbling of the ego and the removal of arrogance and imperiousness from it. Nothing breaks the ego like hunger. Uh, imperiousness calls to heedlessness of Allah Ta'ala, which is a gate to hell and sorrow. To be hungry is to close that gate. And in closing that gate of sorrow is the opening of the gate of happiness. For this reason, when the world was presented to the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Salam, as the people in Quraysh uh, in Mecca, in the early part of the prophethood did, he said, no, I would rather be hungry one day and say, 
and sated another day, for if I am hungry, I am patient and humble, and if I am sated, I am grateful. Right? So in the Prophet's response to, to I'll give you all of this you know, wealth, he said, no, I would be happy, to, I'll be hungry sometimes, and then I'll eat sometimes. Sometimes like this, sometimes like that, so I can appreciate it. You know, if you're always eating grand meals all the time, every day, then your bar of appreciation, you know, goes higher and higher. So you're not going to appreciate the small things. You have a higher expectation. The fourth is that tribulation is from the gates of paradise. Because tribulation is to experience the taste of torment through which dread of torment in the afterlife increases. A human being cannot torment himself with anything in the way that he can with hunger, for indeed he needs no affect affectation for it, and other benefits are connected to it as well. Through hunger, we, he constantly experiences Allah Ta'ala's tribulation, which exhorts to compassion and feeding the needy, whereas the sated is heedless of the hungry person's pain. The fifth, which is one of the greatest benefits, is breaking the other desires, which are the wellsprings of disobedience and conquering the ego. The, I don't know why he said dictatorial, just the ego. It's fine. The Nun al-Misri, one of the Salaf radiallahu uh, anhu said, I have never been sated without either disobeying or considering disobedience. As for the genitals desires, their dangerous, danger is well known. Hunger is enough to quell their evil. Whoever is sated does not control his gen genitals. If consciousness prevents him, he still does not control his eyes, for like the genitals, the eyes fornicate. All acts of disobedience committed by the seven limbs are because of the strength attained through satiation. A wise man once said, no desire whatsoever will interfere with anyone desirous of Allah's pleasure who endures eating nothing but plain bread for a year. When he eats for only half his belly, Allah Ta'ala will lift the burden of lusting for, of four women from him. Our mother Aisha alayhi salam, she said, the first innovation to occur after Allah's Messenger salam, was satiation. It's a very well-known hadith that the first bid'ah after the passing of the Prophet salam, was that people started eating more. The Sahaba, they really didn't you know, eat a lot. Uh, and, and as the expansion of Islam increased and wealth increased, so did the means to buy you know, other things. So people started dressing differently, eating differently, so on and so forth. Verily, and it's not necessarily, we're not talking about haram halal, we're talking about what's optimal. Verily, if a people's bellies are sated, or I think it's supposed to be satiated, but whatever, their egos defy them and turn to the world. The sixth is lightness of the body for prayer, vigils, and worship, and the removal of sleep that prevents worship. Indeed, the capital of happiness is one's lifespan. Sleep detracts from one's lifespan, thus preventing worship, and its foundation is excessive eating. Abu Sulaiman al-Darani, rahimahullah, said six traits enter the character of, of whoever is sated, losing the sweetness of worship, difficulty in memorizing wisdom, no compassion for the creation, because if he is sated, he thinks that all of the creation is sated, heaviness of worship, increase of desires, hanging around garbage, while the rest of the believers hang around the mosques. The seventh is lightness of financial burden, the ability to be satiated, or sorry, the ability to be satisfied with a little from the world and the ability to prefer poverty. Truly, whoever is satisfied with little is freed from gluttony and does not need much money. Most worldly aspirations are thereby rendered obsolete. Whenever he wants to take a loan to fulfill his belly's desire, he instead takes from his self and abandons the belly's desire. Whenever it was said to Ibrahim al Adham, rahimahullah, that a thing was too expensive, he would reply, cheapen it with abandonment. And the interesting thing is this idea of lightness to be more fluid and more active and more in, in a sense creative is also something that is coming back into the dominant culture. So it's very, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, Steve Jobs used to talk about that a lot about, you know, he had a very obscure, a, a very, he went through phases of weird diets uh, but he would always talk about how if he would eat meat or if he would eat too much, he would feel heavy and therefore sluggish and therefore not creative. So it's very common that you find in this sort of entrepreneurial startup world, uh, you know, people trying to make it big in the dunya, they talk about this and they'll actually uh, eat one meal a day and, and go through, you know, excessive uh, means like that to increase their creativity, to increase their uh, their performance, so on and so forth. Of course, that's on the dunya level. Those things can happen, but we want to do that to improve our spiritual sense because what we care about is changing our character. 
and changing on the inside. The dunya stuff is important too, but it's not one or the other. How to reduce eating. Perhaps you say, satiation and eating a lot has become normal to me. So how do I leave it? Know that doing so is very easy, or is easy for whoever wants to do it gradually. This means simply decreasing a little bit from the food one eats daily until in a month's time, the amount of a bun or a roll has been decreased without being noticeable and minimizing food has become normal. Furthermore, if you desire to minimize, then you should pay attention to time, amount, and type. Now, a lot of the examples that he are, he's gonna give might not necessarily be 100% applicable to us today because the types of food that they ate are different than the types of food that we eat. And more importantly, the quality of the same food that's written here, if you take that same food now, that, that same food is gonna be different because it's chemically different, modified and whatnot, and pollution and you know, all that kind of stuff. So think when I read what we read, just think about the concept behind it. Don't be stuck with the examples. As for amount, it has three degrees, in under, like the amount of food. The highest of them, which is the, 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 uh, which is the degree of the truthful ones, is limiting consumption to bare sustenance, after which any further decrease entails taking a risk with one's mind or health. So he's like, this is really the guy or the woman that's going to eat those morsels, little morsels of food only. If they went less than that, they would harm themselves. That was the choice of a Sahla Tustari, Rahimahullah, one of the Salaf uh, you know, saints, who was of the opinion that to pray sitting due to weakness from hunger was better than to pray standing through strength from eating. So this, that, that's an extreme position. And one would probably argue not the most compatible with the Sunnah because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Muslim and uh, Qawi, Ahabu ilallahi min al Muslim and Daif wa fihima. Wa fihima Khair. I think the strong believer is better. Is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the weak believer, even though in both of them is goodness. Why is the strong believer more beloved? Because the strong believer is more beneficial to the community. So we don't want to emaciate ourselves to the point where we can't, I mean, maybe this was at a time when Imam Sahra Tustari, rahimahullah, lived where that was doable because there was a lot of khair and goodness in the community, but not in our communities now. Uh, so, but I mean, I don't think anyone listening to this is going to do that, but it, it just, the comment came out. The second is for you to be satisfied with half of a mud every day, which is one third of the belly. This was the habit of Omar, Sayyidina Omar and a group of the companions whose weekly amount of food was one measure, uh, one saw of barley each, which is the amount of food that we give out, uh, like in the Eid and the Zakat and things like that. It's a very little amount of food. The third is one mud. So the second one was half of the mud. The, sec the third one is one whole mud. Anything above this is the same as normal people and a deviation from the way of the sojourners to Allah, meaning those who are traveling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of us. Although differences between people and conditions may affect these amounts, the principles for a person to extend his hand only when he is truly hungry and thereafter to desist when he truly desires more. The sign of true hunger is that you desire any bread whatsoever without condiments. If it is hard to eat without condiments, then it is a sign of satiation. So the rule, I would say, from, all, from what we've read so far is that only eat, try to get into the habit of only eating when you actually need to eat. Not like, oh, look, it's lunchtime. I got to go, but I'm not really hungry. Is to eat when like, oh, you know what? I can't even concentrate. I need to get something to eat. That's a, way, a good way to start. Because when you do that, you're going to eat what's around. You're not going to think like, oh, no, this is not properly made. And this is a little overcooked. And this is a little over stale. If you're hungry, you're going to eat it. No one's picky in Ramadan. When you guys come to the mosque and we stand in line, we don't care what's in the tray. We're going to eat whatever's in that tray, right? Yeah, because we're, we've been fasting all day. As for time, it also compromises three degrees. The highest is to go for three days or more without food. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu used to go for six days. Ibrahim ibn Adam and Athawdi for seven. And one even went for 40 days. The wonders of the spiritual realm will undoubtedly manifest whoever goes for 40 days without food. However, this is not possible except gradually. 
and, and nor should it necessarily be a goal. The idea is these are just examples for us. And there are stories of uh, scholars and, and saints who have gone to Mecca and only survived on Zemzem. And, you know, when you get into that, that stuff, it's endless. As for the middle degree, it is to go for two days without food. The lowest is for a person to eat once daily. Whoever eats twice has never experienced the condition of hunger from the outset and has thus abandoned its virtue. As for type, the highest form is wheat bread with condiments. The lowest form is barley bread without condiments. Uh, and to constantly eat it with condiments is extremely disliked. Like the bread that we eat is highly refined, it's even more refined than you know, the, the wheat that is, is mentioned here. Uh, Imam uh, Omar ibn al-Khattab said to his son, eat bread with meat one time, bread with butter one time, bread with yogurt one time, bread with salt another time, and plain, bre bre plain bread another time. This is a lesson on the best way of eating according to the people of worship, meaning that he would only eat meat once, he's saying only eat meat once a week. As for the sojourners or the travelers on the path, they have gone to an extreme in regards to abandoning condiments. Condiments meaning all that extra stuff that you would put on the food. Rather than abandoning desires altogether, this is to the extent that some of them would crave a desirable thing for 10 or 20 years, oppose themselves, and prevent it from its desire. The Prophet Sallallahu said, the worst of my community are those who relish in food and their bodies are fattened by it. Their only concern is the colors of food and the clothes, and they talk with affectation, meaning they're, they're acting and pretending. We have already explained the ways of the pious predecessors, meaning the Salaf, in regards to abandoning desires in the book, breaking the two desires from the ahiyat, which is translated. Okay, so this is a big, you know, big stuff Imam al-Ghazali is talking about. A lot of people don't want to hear this. And this is, you know, I'm glad we have it because we need this reminder. Myself, you know, first and foremost, we need to be reminded of this. My suggestion is that you, one, get into the habit of eating, if, you know, if you can, giving your work and school schedule, of course, but getting into the habit of eating when you feel like you need to eat. That's an easy thing to start because you're still going to eat. I'm not saying not to eat, but just to learn to eat when you need to eat. The second thing, which is a little bit harder, is to try to skip one meal a week or have the meal a week. Like if in lunch you have three things, go to two things, so on and so forth. That will be more appropriate for people in our time than the examples that he's giving uh, in the in the book for the reasons that I mentioned. How are we doing on time? Okay, I'm going to read a little bit in the next section, but the next section I believe is much longer. Yeah. Oh, it's much longer. Okay, we'll read a little bit. The second principle. The second principle. <clears throat> I think I've been in Cairo too long. Every time I come to speak, the words are mumbled. The second principle is locatiousness, which is to overspeak or speak a lot. Again, maybe I'm glad Imam, I'm glad I'm just reading Imam al Ghazali because if I chose these as like khutbah topics, I don't think people would want to hear me. So I'm glad that, you know, we can just say, well, Imam al Ghazali wrote it. There is no choice but to cut it out. <laughs> the, the, the first thing he says, there is no choice but to cut it out. For indeed, the deeds of all the limbs affect the heart, but the tongue especially so. This is because it conveys the images that are written within the heart. The, the tongue in the Arab, in the, uh, amongst the Arabs is called turjiman al-lisan, uh, turjiman al-qalb. That the tongue is what expresses what's in the heart. It translates and expresses and vocalizes what's in the heart. So when you talk to somebody, if you listen to what they're saying, and if you listen to what, they, what they're really saying, that's what's going to be on their inside. Because somebody can only fake it for so long. Eventually, it comes out. Thus, for every word, there is an image in the heart that corresponds to it. If it is a lie, then a false image occurs in the heart and misdirects it. If it is something pointless and unnecessary, then the heart is blackened and made dark until ultimately excessive speech leads to the death of the heart. So not only is the heart going to express on what's on the inside, but as you say stuff, there's going to be a ramifications on your heart. It's like a two-way street. You're going to be rewarded or you're going to incur sin. For this reason, Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, attached great importance to the tongue saying, whoever can guarantee me what is between their jaws and their legs, I can guarantee paradise for them. He was once asked about what would cause 
people to enter the hellfire. And he said, والسلام, the two orifices, the mouth and the private part. It should just be translated as private part because it's not something that's just about women. Uh, that's a literal translation, I think. That's a mistake. <clears throat> he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, Are people turned on their noses in hellfire? Hal yakubu nasa ala wujuhim? Are they like, did they fall on their face? You know, may Allah Ta'ala protect us. This is a very graphic image, but the, one of the images of the hellfire is that people will fall on their face and be dragged on their face into the hellfire. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that what drags them is what their tongues bring in the dunya are people turned on their noses in hell again this is a, a literal translation i think it could have been done better for anything other than the harvest of their tongues hasaida al sinatuhum the the what the harvest of their tongues meaning all of the stuff that we said in this dunya and all of the stuff that we reaped as a result this can cause somebody to be dragged into the hellfire may allah ta'ala protect us And whoever is silent is saved. Mu'adh once said to him, meaning to the Prophet, what deed is the best? The Prophet said, stuck out his tongue and put his hand on it and said, surely the majority of the son of Adam's sins are by his tongue. I'm sorry, I just want to look up the one hadith that I just read in the Arabic text. Yeah. Okay. The Prophet also said, whoever believes in Allah on the last day, he should speak good or be quiet. My grandfather used to always say this to me. And whoever talks frequently, blathers frequently, and whoever blathers frequently, sins frequently, whoever sins frequently, hell is most fit for him. This is very similar to the English expression, loose lips sink ships. But in this case, the ship is yourself. So if you talk a lot, eventually you're going to mistalk, is what he's saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you're always talking, if you're always running your mouth, that means you're not listening. Eventually you get used to filling up that empty, quiet space. You're not comfortable with the quiet. So you have to fill it in. So you constantly talk and talk and talk. Eventually you're going to say something wrong. Eventually, you're going to lie. Eventually, you're going to insult somebody, uh, backbite, so on and so forth. And you just sort of, that, that thread just yanks you all the way into the hellfire. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. Because of this, a Siddiq radiallahu anhu used to put a stone in his mouth to prevent him from speaking. Know that the tongue has 20 ailments that we have explained in the book of the tongue and the ailments in the Ahya. Mentioning them here would take too long and acting upon one verse will suffice you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا خير في كثير من نجواكم إلا من أمر بصدقة أو معروف أو إصلاح بين الناس. There is no good in much of their conversation except for he who commands charity, good, or reconcil reconciliation between people. So you, you, you use your mouth to call to good action. And when we talk about the tongue, you know, this also... It means other forms of expression like our social media, texting, you know, phone calls, emails, that's all under the quote unquote tongue. So either we, we encourage people to do something good or we do good ourselves by saying it or we reconcile between people. This means that you do not speak about whatever does not concern you and you limit your speech to what is important. That's the rule. That should be underlined. That's if you want to practice this, if you want to master this for yourself learn and start by not speaking about things that do not concern you because most of the time we do we, we love that we love to just talk about things that are not our concern and gossip it's a big problem we all have it but that's how you start you ask you know before you speak think does this concern me it really doesn't concern me so why do i need to participate to it Therein is salvation. Anas radiallahu anhu said, a young man amongst us was martyred on the day of Uhud and a stone was found tied to his belly from the hunger. His mother wiped the dust from his face and said, enjoy your place in paradise, oh my little son. 
So Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, do you not realize that maybe he used to speak about what did not concern him and withheld what it would not harm him to give? The definition of what does not concern one is that which if left, no reward is lost by it, nor any deed fulfilled by it. Wallahi, just leaving this is a, and many family problems uh, occur because people talk about things that do not concern them. And it's such a liberating thing not to be concerned about things that don't concern you. I mean, you have enough stuff to deal with yourself. Why add to it? I think sometimes because it makes us feel better because I don't want to deal with my problems. I'll, I'll have fun with some, my neighbor's problems. But we should re be working on our own problems. Whoever limits their speech to this will speak only a little. The slave should account for himself whenever he mentions what does not concern him. If he were to remember Allah Ta'ala instead of uttering that word, it would be a treasure from the treasures of happiness. How then can reason allow the abandonment of buried treasure and take hold of a pile of mud? This is in the case of there not being any sin involved. If sin were involved, then it is like leaving a buried treasure and taking hold of a flame. Speech that should be of no concern to anyone includes tales of travel, types of cuisine, in different customs and their countries and their customs, the state of people and the states of industry and business and all of that which people are seen delving into. Not meaning that you, you don't wanna learn about other things, but getting involved in people's stuff. So um, so-and-so uh, just went on a trip and came back and you, real, you found out that they were on a trip. So you don't be like, oh, what'd you do? What'd you eat? What'd you see? Just like, oh, mashallah, I hope you had a good time. Barakallah fiqh. Alhamdulillah, salama, you know, welcome back, things like that. To learn not to ask things that doesn't concern you. Perhaps you would like to know the details of some of these ailments of the tongue. Know that there are five of the 20 ailments that predominantly, that predominate. Lying, backbiting, arguing, praising, and joking. I think we'll be able to do the first, the lying. Or maybe that's too long too. Okay, we'll do a little bit of the lying and I'll stop some, somewhere in the middle to leave time. Uh, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina. The first is lying. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu said, the slave will not cease to lie and be bent on lying until he is written as a pathological liar with Allah. Meaning that if you, it's like a drug, you start lying once, then you, you can do it twice, then you can do it 10 times, then you just, it become, you, then you are written with Allah, this is a path, and I love, that's a good translation, pathological liar. Now, kathab, fa'al, meaning that the sifa, meaning that the trait is embedded in that person. So he says, you are written, may Allah Ta'ala protect us as a pathological liar. One of the things that the Prophet Sallallahu said about lying, uh, and this is a very important hadith that's mentioned in the introduction of Sahih Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu said, "Kafa bil mar'i kathiba an yuhaditha bi kulli ma sami'a." It is enough to be called a liar that you repeat everything that you hear, and that's what makes somebody a liar. You hear something, you feel like you got to repeat it. Somebody says something, you have to go out and tell somebody else, rather than sometimes hearing something and just retaining it and not repeating it. Maybe it's just a point of reflect. Maybe Allah opened that for you, for you to reflect, but not necessarily to pass on. The Prophet Sallallahu also said, woe to he who talks and lies to make people laugh. He saw also said, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, he, who, he also said, woe to him, woe to him. It was said, O Allah's, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi does the believer fornicate? Does the believer steal? He said that could be the case. It is possible that a, a believer can commit sin, even if there are the major sins, may Allah Ta'ala protect us. So then the person asked, does he lie? The Prophet Sallallahu no, only those who do not believe in Allah's signs make up lies. I mean, that hadith is so scary to me. Can a, a believer commit zina? The Prophet Sallallahu yeah. Can the believer steal? Yeah, he can steal. Can the believer do this? Can, can the believer lie? The Prophet says, no. It's almost as if your belief itself is suspended when you lie. That's how gross and grotesque and, and bad lying is. And when we talked about the Sira, for those of you who remember, we talked about Abu Sufyan. I believe it was when Abu Sufyan went to uh, uh, Heraclius. Uh, I think it was Dihya uh, al-Kalbi, the Prophet says, emissary, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Heraclius wanted to speak and hear from both sides. So he told Sufyan, don't lie, you know, tell me, but don't lie. And Abu Sufyan was so offended. He was still 
a non-believer at that point, he was so offended that how could I lie? I'm the Sayyid of my people. Even the, even the, the Kafir at that time was offended that somebody would even insinuate that he would lie. And today, how many of us just lie easily? Oh, it's a white lie, it's a small lie, it's a this, it's a that. It's a really bad thing. And I mean, you can't talk about that enough. He also said, I saw some, shall I te not teach you about the greatest of major sins, ascribing a partner to Allah Ta'ala and disobeying your parents? And when he was saying this, he was leaning back. Then he sat up and he said, Sallallahu Alaihi and speaking falsehood, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Allah will seal the believer upon any character characteristic except treachery and lying. On some of the rules of lying, know that lying is unlawful in regards to everything except in dire need to the extent that a woman once said to her small son, come here so I can give you something. The Prophet Sallallahu said, what were you going to give him if he came to you? And she said, a date. He replied, if you had not done so, it would have been written against you as a lie. A person should be aware of lying even in their imagination and inner thoughts. Indeed, this establishes a crooked image in their consciousness until even a person's dreams, lies, and the secrets of the spiritual realm are not revealed to them in their sleep. Experience bears witness to this. Of course, a lie is permitted if the truth would lead to another prohibited thing that is worse than lying. Then it is permissible just as eating a carcass, meaning a, a meta, something that is not slaughtered, just as eating a carcass is permissible if le leaving it leads to something prohibited that is worse than eating it, which is the soul perishing, meaning that if you're going to die and starve to death and there's like a haram food, then you could eat the haram food. Umm Kalthum salam, said, Allah's Messenger Sassam, did not permit lying about anything except three matters. A man saying something with the intent of reconciliation, a man saying something in war, and a man talking to his wife. So I'm going to explain these and then we'll stop here. What does this mean? A man saying something with the intent of reconciliation. So there are two brothers that are fighting and they're not speaking to each other in the masjid. So I go to one, uh, Abdullah and Omar. So I go to Abdullah, I say, Abdullah, you know, Omar, you, you know, Omar is, feels really bad about what he did. Uh, Omar, uh, you know, if you talk to Omar or if you pick up, or if you send him a message, he's going to be so happy and he's going to respond. And I have no idea if Omar is going to do that, but I'm trying to, so I go to Omar. So I say the same thing to Omar, you know, Abdullah feels really bad about what he did. If you send a text message, I bet you he's going to respond. You know, he's going to be so happy just to hear from you so on and so forth. Why? Because I'm trying to bring them together. So it's not like a lie. I mean, it's not, I didn't hear either of them say that, but my intent is I'm trying to bring them together. So that's one. The other one is war. Well, I mean, that we get that, you know, uh, you can't give away secrets in, in, when you're in a state of war in an army. And sometimes you have to be, you have to have deception. The Prophet said al-harb al-khida, that warfare is deception. And you have to, part of the strategy of warfare well, actually, the ultimate strategy of warfare is not to fight at all, is to win the battle without even fighting. And the way you do that is with deception, to deceive the enemy into thinking that you have a superior force, that you're going to go here and not here, so on and so forth. So if you study warfare, especially the pre-modern warfare, I mean, modern warfare is, is like a completely different beast. I mean, Allah Ta'ala protect us. I was just speaking with somebody whose father was a Vietnam vet uh, uh, vet and had major, major problem, mental problems, uh, drug addiction coming back from war. I mean, modern warfare is just, may Allah Ta'ala protect us from that. But in here, the context, if you think about pre-modern warfare, you know, up until <clears throat> the American Civil War, which is really probably the last of the classical war fought. Anyway, you, people understand that. And a man talking to his wife if you say to your wife, you know, you're the most beautiful woman in the world. I've never seen anyone more beautiful. They, oh, you look, you look perfect. You look like an angel. Things like that it might not be true on the haqiqa, but Jenny, you're saying something nice. You're expressing your love to your wife and vice versa. Wallahu ta'ala, a'la wa a'lam. Okay. Uh, let's see. I shared in the chat earlier. Well, I'll do that at the end. Uh, could you say more of the practice of fasting on Mondays and Thursdays, which the Prophet saw some? Yeah. yeah, so the Prophet saw some, other than <clears throat> fasting the month of Ramadan, the Prophet saw some would fast Mondays and Thursdays. And then the Prophet saw some would also fast the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th 
of the lunar months. Those are the months in which there's our, there are full moon um, and they're called the white nights because the moon is in the, the fullest and the most beautiful and radiant. That's also Sunnah. Uh, and then there are other days like the day of Ashura, uh, the day of your birthday, fasting on your birthday is a Sunnah. The Prophet Sassam fasted on Mondays and he said, why do you fast on Mondays? He said, Hada fi. this is the day in which I was born. So he, 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 he observed his birthday Sassam, every week, every Monday. Uh, and for those people who read the Dala'al al Khairat, the manual of uh, prayers on the Prophet, Sassam, there are two recitations on Monday the, the, the last recitation and then the first recitation in honor of that's the day in which the Prophet Sassam, was born. So fasting on your birthday is actually a sunnah. Uh, what, what else do we have? The, the end in Rajab, there are some days of fasting. They're not very well supported, but. Uh, the Isra and Maraj, the 15th of Sha'ban, we usually fast the day of Arafah, the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Arafah, so on and so forth. So there are many other days to fast. I think if you add them all up, about half the year, including Ramadan, the Prophet Sazam was fasting in, in one way, shape, or form. Uh, so there are, if you want to attack or tackle the food stuff, extra fast, because they're voluntary fast, is also another way. So you can also forego what I said earlier about uh, uh, eating when you're hungry I mean that's also good advice but in addition to or parallel to that you can simply fast some of those extra days whether it be weekly or monthly as a practice because that would also be voluntarily voluntarily going hungry uh, if a situation you don't oops in, in a, if in a situation you don't clarify a point that people has other data that the speaker doesn't know about. Is this a lie? Not volunteering information. Oh, so a speaker is speaking and you know something that they don't know and you don't volunteer. Is that a lie? No, it's not a lie because it depends what, what you know, like what if the khatib is speaking and he makes a mistake, but the khutbah is a monologue. You can't, it's not a dialogue. So wait till the khatib is done and then, you know, you can talk to the khatib. But don't just stand up in the middle of the mosque and just if, you, if the khatib made a mistake, unless it's a mistake in the Quran recitation, that could be corrected. Uh, what if you're in, um, you know, uh, you're invited to, you know, some like massive function or something like that, or you disagree with the speaker, or you're like invited to a church, and like the the pastor is is going on and on about something, and you're like, this guy's dead wrong, you know. But you're like, you're not even Christian, you know. You're you're you're, you're there as a guest. So maybe it's from the hikmah is that you just let it slide. You don't have to correct everything that's, no, that's not a lie at all. And sometimes it could be good. It, it could be right to do that. And then the opposite is true. Sometimes it's necessary to do that. It depends on what the error is. Like if somebody makes a mistake of deen, you have an ob we have an obligation, all of us to correct that. So if I make a mistake, like I've told Ennis this all many times. I said, Ennis, anytime I make a mistake in the Quran, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, please, I allow you to correct me. And please correct me. Because I don't want to ever make a mistake of the Quran. I don't want that on my shoulders. Uh, so I, I welcome, I, I love that. I mean, I feel bad that I made a mistake, but I'm, alhamdulillah, at least I was corrected. So it's those type of things, yeah, we should correct one another because we, we hold ourselves to the higher standard. But there are other things which you can just let the thing slide because maybe it's not appropriate. Maybe you interjecting will have a worse effect. So you have to gauge. But is that considered lying? No, it's not considered lying. It's very humbling fasting on one's birthday. Yeah, and what would be really cool is if you figure out your Hijri birthday, so then you can fast on your Hijri birthday and on your solar birthday. That would be, so you'd fast twice a year. And the Prophet Sallallahu solar birthday is April 20th. We often talk with those who aren't the closest with us to make one another comfortable, to avoid awkward silences. Is there a notion of beneficial small talk in the sunnah? Yes, uh, of course, because you are, that's a form of charity. Uh, and not just charity, but that's the form of one of the acts that takes you to paradise. I think when we did the 40 acts way back in the very beginning of COVID, I was doing those like little videos i think we we're like emailing them out there should be on the playlist on the on the channel 
but uh, you know, like a guest is here or a traveler or a foreigner or a refugee. I mean, these are the people that tend to be lonely and giving them um, comfort, uh, that's great. So it's not that talking, so sometimes when we read the examples, we can make the wrong conclusion. I mean, we all do that because when I read them, when I prepare before the class, I always feel bad about myself. I'm like, man, I suck. I talk too much. I eat too much. I do this too much. And I got to remind myself, okay, well, you know, I have to find a way to implement it. So you don't walk around like a mute and be like, I'm practicing because then you can become arrogant because you can be like, I'm not speaking because I'm working on myself, but rather don't worry about that small talk part. Worry about not talking about things that don't concern you. That's where you should start. Be and we'll talk about the backbiting and the lying in, in the next like two weeks at least, that will really become clear of what we're not supposed to talk about. Because you don't want to end up saying something that hurts someone's feeling, that says something haram, that causes someone harm uh, or, you know, or causes harm to you or someone starts cursing you and things like that. So the, where I would start is that when people are talking about something and like it doesn't concern you, don't get involved because then you can add fuel to that fitna. That's how I would think about it. Is there a tradition to fast on the maulid? Yeah, some people fast on the, on the, on the day of the Prophet's birthday. Of course, he, when he was asked why he fasted Monday, he said, because this is the day I was born. Our, our maulid tradition is more about reciting the story of his birth, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because for, for multiple reasons. One, because of the miraculous uh, events that happened at his birth, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, also, it's part of the seerah, so it's, it's a review. Also, we celebrate that that's the beginning of this, you know, beautiful existence on earth and this beautiful message. And, you know, how could we not celebrate the beginning of that? He also passed on his birthday too. Uh, he died on a Monday, or he passed وسلم, on a Monday on the day he was born. He also entered Medina on the day of his birthday. So the Milad we have to remember all of those things. It's the hijrah, entering into Medina. It's the birth. It's the passing, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So usually that's what we do. And, and to do that, uh, the ulama, hundreds of ulama have written little stories of the birth of the Prophet sallallahu That's what the word maulid is. And usually sometimes they're stories that are just written in prose. Sometimes there are stories written in poetry form. Sometimes they are sung. Uh, all of those. And that's sort of a you know, very short digest of like how the Muslim world has celebrated the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it's a, it's a time of happiness. So we want to celebrate. We want to remember what we, why are we so excited about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa What's so special about him in our lives? What does he mean for us today? You know, and express that joy and, and happiness. That's what we want, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, I, I'm asked to remind you that the next Ask, uh, ask Tarek session, uh, will be not this week, but next week in the mosque, inshallah. I'll be back, inshallah. So inshallah, I'll make it <laughs> with a negative PCR test. You know, this vaccine card QR reader in, in this part of the world is very tricky. So. You always have to get a QR. Uh, I, I wish I could open up a lab in my house because it's like I'm spending so much money on this QR. Anyway, so we'll be in the mosque. So don't forget to send the email to support at iccpmd.org uh, by Monday so that I can get the questions. And then also our own Maulid uh, is on the 17th, which is a Sunday, October 17th, inshallah. Uh, for some people, it's easy not to eat for hours. Others, they graze all day, small pieces. Could you touch on that from the point of view of the last chapter? Uh, well, that's why I, I preface the, the chapter on food by we have, to up, we have to take the concept and apply it to what the, the day and age in which we live because the quality and the nature of the foods that we eat now is completely different than what Imam al-Ghazali was eating 
Furthermore, our lifestyle is completely different than their lifestyle. I mean, they were very physical. We are not, we are very sedentary. I mean, right now I'm in another continent talking to you in another continent. This type of technology didn't exist. So there will be differences. The point is not to overeat. And the point is to uh, eat, to try to get into the habit of eating when you're hungry. The grazing person might actually be able to do that better because they probably graze because they feel a little bit of hunger and they have a little bit of a little nibble and then they go back. And people have blood pressure issues and, and, and you know, blood sugar issues and all of that. So of course you have to take that into consideration, but the idea is not to overeat rich foods all the time, not, not to eat like a Thanksgiving meal every day. You know, let's put it like that because there are some cultures and that's what, what they do daily, weekly, uh, things like that. So is to try to learn to eat when one is, needs to eat, to eat a little bit less, to not eat till you're completely full at each meal. And also we would add probably the quality of food. It's when he talked about a little bit, the quality of the different types of breads. That's very va valuable for us today because the quality of food is very, uh, uh, there's a huge gambit of the quality of foods now. We have everything from, you know, somebody's picking organic stuff in their backyard to junk food. Um, and that's important also that we want to eat the right types of food because the, what we eat is going to eventually, eventually affect us spiritually. Anybody else? Oh, there's something about Buddhism. I missed that. Oh, I missed many questions. Sorry. Oh, the prophets are honored the full moon day in the Buddhist culture. Two full moon days observed in devotion and limited eating and no drinking. Also, as you stated, Steve Jobs also was spare. And yeah, I didn't know about the Buddhist full day. Uh, I know that a lot of people, myself included, have difficulty sleeping. Uh, on the full moon nights and I think one of my kids as well and I wonder if that also impacts it as, uh, uh, as well I should try fasting those days to see if the sleep helps uh, but there is a, a you know the sunnah of these things is very rhythmic with the natural world uh, there is a reason why Monday and Thursday and there's a reason why the, the middle of the month so on and so forth so uh, it is fascinating very fascinating and it'd be interesting if somebody did a study on that, or maybe there is, a, I haven't read. Did I miss anything? Okay. I want to share the salawat information again. Oh, oops, I sent it to one person by mistake. So I promised, I believe last class, that um, one second, we gotta copy it again. I promised that I would share. Come on now. The salawat that I end the class with, known as the salawat of Imam. Shafi'i. Man. Oh, there's the copy button. For some reason, I'm not able to share. Try it again, one last time. Try a control C. There we go. So I just put that in the chat for everyone. This is the, um, how we end the class. Uh, this is the salo, it's known as the salawat of Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah. Uh, it's found in the introduction of his book, al risala uh, which is uh, the first book that was written on Usul al-Fiqh, one of the uh, main contributions that Imam al-Shafi made to the study of Islamic law. 
Uh, and in Egypt, it's a, tra it's a tradition, it used to be a tradition that, or it is still a tradition that classes, the Shafi fiqh classes and classes that Shafi fiqh teachers end with that, you know, out of respect for Imam Shafi. And it used to be uh, the sign that a student passed their exams. So it's just sort of like a cultural thing that exists. So in my classes, actually, most of my classes, this is how we ended class. Uh, whatever the class was, we would end with the salawat. So it's just like a habit. It's just like a, like, I feel like it's not right unless I do it. It's just sort of like a habit thing. So that's how I, that's just the tradition that I have and I keep. So that's, I, I'm sharing it with you. So you have it. Hopefully it's legible, the um, Arabic, the transliteration and the translation. Okay, so we can, we, we'll, we'll, we'll put a pin in it there. Are there salawat the other three imams said? I'm sure. I don't know of those other traditions. Um, of course, there are salawat, but this is, why did this become the concluding of the class? I don't know. That's the answer. I don't know the answer to that question. Why did it become a tradition like that? There are other traditions, of course, and the other madahib. Um, but uh, they, they is, it, I don't know them. I don't know them. If I, if I do, I'll pass them on. So it is, oh Allah, send your best prayers and salutations upon the best creation, our master Muhammad, his family, his companions, as much as your knowledge, as much as your perfection, which all those two are infinite, so it means infinitely send the salawat on him, as much as those who invoke you and as much as those who are heedless of him. So in a way, nothing is left out. So it's infinite blessings and prayers to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam without limit, essentially, as, as is uh, appropriate for his station and his exalted status, sallallahu alayhi wa Okay. Allahumma salli afdal salatin ala as'adi makhluqatika sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim adada ma'lumatika wa midada kalimatika kullama dhakaraka dhakiruna wa ghafala an dhikrihi al-ghafilun Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh